This is John Bandela. Thank you for coming out this afternoon. I'm going to be talking about easy binary compatible interfaces across compilers in C++. So what's the problem? So I follow the old new thing blog here. And if you do a Google search on it, um, one of the first questions it says is, if the shell is written in C++, why don't you just export the base classes? You know, and just make not everything so complicated. The problem is there's, the, there's no easy way to share a class that's compiled with compiler A with, an, with uh, something else that's compiled with compiler B. You often have to rebuild components if uh, your library, standard library changes or your compiler changes. Uh, in Imperfect C++, Matthew Wilson uh, quotes some unnamed former friend of C++ saying, the biggest fault in C++ for my money is the lack of standard of an ABI. As a direct consequence, C++ code compiled with GCC won't work with C++ code compiled with MSVC unless you provide a C interface. This forces all C++ providers looking to provide generic reusable code to use C linkage at some point. We know, of course, that he's wrong. The biggest fault in C++ is we have bad acronyms. <laughs> All right, what are we going to cover in this talk? Uh, why calling C++ code across compilers is, is hard? How we can currently do it? How to make it easier to define, implement, and use interfaces that work across compilers? And then what are you know, developer libraries and talk about some of the library features and how we can use them? And then just look at you know what I you know what my goal is and what my vision is for those. Uh, the code is all available at GitHub under my uh, GitHub at cross compiler call. And this is an interactive talk uh, with lots of code shown. So if you've got any questions at all or you've got a different opinion, just feel free to interrupt me. All right, why is it hard? So some things that are common to both C and C++, we've got calling conventions, and we've got structure packing. Now in C++, we've got the addition of name angling, virtual function implementation, runtime type information, exception handling, and the standard library implementation. So how do we share with C? So calling convention, this specifies how arguments and return values are handled, who cleans up the stack, what registers are used for what. We can usually handle this by basically using a platform specific define, like if we're trying to define, you know, go cross compiler code for, you know, on Windows we might define a calling convention, a standard call. Then we, you know, define a function with our calling convention. Uh, structure packing, uh, the compiler is allowed to insert padding and structures. And if the two compilers don't agree, you're going to get, you know, you're going to get garbage. And there you use different compiler specific pragmas and keywords. Uh, I believe uh, GCC, Clang, and MSVC all support, I think, the, uh, the pragma packs. So how do we share? So there's three main ways we can share in C++. One is to use extern C. And the second way is to use, basically, use vtables that are generated by the compiler. And the third way is programmer generated vtables. So here's our motivating example. Everybody is doing key value stores these days. So just a simple one that's key value stores got a constructor, destructor. You can put something in there. You can get something out. Um, and you can delete something. And the, the Boolean values, they just say if, if you try to get something that isn't there, it'll return a false. And delete, if you try to delete something that's not there, will also return a false. All right. Oh. Everybody seeing okay or is it okay? Okay, extern C. So we can use extern C to avoid C++ name mangling. And then what we do, we unpack each of our public members into global functions that take an opaque pointer. So here's some code. So we define an, define an opaque pointer here, KV store, and handle to a KV store. Uh, we use, and uh, we find the error code as SCD in 32. And extern C. So we have a create KV store that returns the opaque pointer, destroy, so our constructor destructor. And then our put. And let's say you know we may want embedded nulls in our thing, so we need a, a key and a key and a character count, value and a value count. Get uh, count, value out, value count, 
And then for the returns, uh, Boolean, I believe, uh, they, there's no size specified. So the compiler is free to you know, pick whatever. It can be one, one, uh, 8 bits, 32 bits. But so we just, we just pick one. For this one, we use a char. And uh, that we use out parameters. And uh, delete, same thing. We use out parameters. And we're using error codes. Any questions? So here's how we implement it. Just to keep stuff simple, we're just going to use a, a standard standard map to string and uh, create KV store. We return a new KV store. You know, if we have an exception, we return a null putter. Uh, destroy it, deletes it. Um, put. So put there, we basically, we had to convert it back from our, basically a, our pointer and a count back to an STD string. So key value and then just use the map functionality. And returning zero if we succeed, negative one if there's an error. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. That's better. Um, same with get. Is everybody able to read back there? Or we'll just all right for this one. We'll just do delete. Say, same type of thing. We convert them to as standard strings. We use them, and then we basically you know convert it back to the you know back to our return value. And here's how we use it. Uh, we create the K, KV store. You know, create key value, put, you know, KV store key value, key.data, key.size, value.data, value.size. And then we call a get, you know, we output the value, delete it, destroy. Yes? You're describing the bad old days, right? Yes. Okay, so you're going to show us something better than this. Oh, yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, this is not the. Oh, sorry. The question was, this is the bad old days. And the answer is, yes, this is the bad old days. OK, so what's it good for? So we can use it on multiple C++ compilers. We can even call it from C. The biggest problem is you lose polymorphism. Uh, if you implement, a, say you implement, want to implement like hierarchical storage on top of your key value store, how do you use multiple implementations? You, know, you want something you can pass around and call. For that, we need some type of object. So one way to do an object is take advantage of compiler-generated V tables. So if you've got this um, abstract interface here, you've got pure virtual function, function one, function two, and then you can derive and do your implementation. Uh, the compiler will, will basically generate this structure. You've got uh, your V pointer, which is an array of, of function pointers. And from function one will go to here, function two will go to here. So here's how we look implementing it with vtables. Now notice that even though we're using the compiler to do stuff, we, we still can't use standard character stuff, standard library usage, and we still can't use exceptions. So pretty much, you know, we leave out the you know, handle KV store, but basically you know, it's the same signatures. And we just make them pure virtual. Our implementation, we'll just look at put again. You know, pretty much the same thing, key value. You know, we have, you know, put our value in there. Tr cat, don't let any exceptions get out of here. Negative one if we fail, zero if we succeed. Yes? So your contention is that you can rely on various compilers to implement virtual functions identically? Uh, one second there. Let me get back with that. Uh, same. And then to get the implementation, you know, we export a function that says KV implementation, return new KV store implementation. And then here's how we use it. And, you know, IKV put, you know, so still pretty low level, still feels like, you know, C with classes, bad old days. All right, so we've got polymorphism. You can pass the interface from one DLL to another that expects it. But mentioned above, the weakness is you're depending on a compiler transformation. 
and the compiler, you know, it can be free to do that. You know, some do, some, you know, it may not do that. So, you, but you're depending on that. Uh, basically, we're depending on the V table uh, format, like the, between the representation of, you know, V tables, and that, that's what you're depending on. So the solution to this is basically we create a struct containing function pointers instead of relying on the compiler. Um, I, I, Imperfect C++ has a whole chapter on how to do that and a bunch of macros to try to make it easier. So this is what it looks like. So instead of having um, pure virtual functions, we instead you know, basically do function pointers. So it's pretty much the same, uh, same signature, put, get, delete, destroy. And you know, we call that our V table. We have a struct IKV store, and it just contains a pointer to our V table. So we're basically generating this by hand, what the compiler is doing. And then in our implementation, we derive from IKV store. And then we set our V table. We store a V table. And then we just put function pointers in. And then basically, we use static cast to downcast when everything's passed. And we know that you know, it, it's, a, you know, it's a parent of us. So we can static cast down there and do what it is we need to do. For example, put, you know, we get our key, get our value, static cast this, access the M, access the map, put the key value in there. Same problem there. Uh, how we return it, return, you just, you know, new it. And how we use it, we had to create, destroy, put, um, and then, like I said, we're getting and, you know, Old style ugly. All right, so what we've basically done is we've in reinvented the binary interface of COM. Okay, and if anybody anybody work with COM back in like the 90s, especially the late 90s? Okay, anybody have good memories of working with COM from C back in the 90s? Is there any such thing as a good memory of that? Yeah, one that's lost. <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, but basically, if you go search the web for solutions for cross-compiler interfaces, you basically end up either with COM explicitly or else somebody reinvents COM, that B table thing. So COM works. It's not easy from C++. So this, you know, we're definitely not at the easy part for our cross-compiler binary interfaces. So let's look at how COM, compilers, COM signatures look. You've got H result. Standard call, you know, basically specifying your calling convention. Function name, parameter type one, two, and you return type that's basically done as a, a you know, a, an out parameter. And there's no, no exceptions. Your return type is not the logical return type. Like, you know, our logical return type in that case was a bool, and, you know, we're returning an H result or an error code, and, you know, we're doing an out parameter. And the, low, and the parameters are all low levels. Anybody notice the memory leak in the previous code that we've just been going through? We never free that. Key yeah, we never free the free value, which brings up a whole other problem of memory management. It's like, how do we free that? We can't delete it, you know? So, you know, we can't delete it because it, you know, what is it? Right here, and p-value show the get. See, so your get is the one you can see, but get right here is allocating a, a new char, and then basically here, when we use it, you know, we're, we're getting it, but we're we're never deleting it. And the problem is, you know, we just can't call. It's not as simple as calling delete on it, because you know you had to have the same you know, runtime structures in the same runtime library for, you know, for it to do and delete. So you basically have to have some sort of, you know, standardized memory allocation, deallocation. COM solves that with, uh, I believe, CO task alloc mem. Alrighty. So what can we do to make it easier? We can handwrite wrappers. There's a lot of people that, people that wrote, you know, they use COM, 
I bet some of you guys did this, you know, for the one interfaces that you used a lot. Hand wrote some wrappers, you know, they wrapped it up, you know, use RAII. So you know, people write to make them easier to use. There's not a lot of people that write them to make them easier to implement. And writing two wrappers for every interface would get old really fast. Macros, limited, hard to use, fragile, especially in modern C++ with templates and commas. Compiler extensions. Uh, Visual C++ did an import for a while, take a com type, write a wrapper to make it easier to use. It'll generate the wrapper types. Like I said, not standard and more with usage than implementation. There's custom code generators. There's something called Comet, which took a TLB 2H file and uh, last worked on appears to be in 2004. Then the other way we can go is language extensions. So I guess it was a year ago or a year and a half ago, Microsoft introduced C++ CX. And basically, Jim Springfield got up and talked about why they created compiler extensions. So a problem with, with COM in the current libraries is authoring components is very difficult to do. Separate tool to author interface, author types. But if we're just using from C++, that's not an issue. No way to automatically map interfaces from low level to high level form that throws exceptions and has real return values. And I think that makes a big difference and no unification of authoring and conception patterns. So what can we do? All right, so I am a fan of Jackie Chan. And the martial arts movies, they always, they have this plot outline, right? The hero meets the villain, you know, and he gets beaten up. Hero meets master and he learns, and then the hero meets the villain again and beats up the villain, right? So C++ in 11 enables us to make things easier, which have been hard for C++ in the past. So doing cross-compiler interfaces in the past has been hard for C++. I mean, this is, I mean, this could be your face when you hear that you had to work with COM, right? So we're going to see what we can do to make it better. So goals for this library. No external tools. Header only. We want to make it, okay, use this, and you create your stuff. You define an interface once, and you can use it to both implement off of it and use it. Uh, make the interfaces easy to implement and use once you define them. We want to support string, vector, pair, and allow the user to add support for custom types. Use real to turn types. Allow use of exceptions. Support interface inheritance. Support some type of implementation inheritance or implementation reuse. Make it binary compatible with COM and support multiple platforms. So we got our work cut out for us. Non-goals. So make it easier to use from different languages. Part of what makes COM complicated is, you know, it was wanting to use from Visual Basic, from Excel, from, you know, everything else. So our focus is on C++11 to C++11. And what also is a non-goal is no compromise machine efficiency. So cross-compiler code will never be as fast as a template library where the compiler can see everything. We've already created some barriers. Um, you're going to trade some efficiency to if we can get a significant usability benefit out of it. Try to be as efficient as possible, maintain usability benefit. All right, here is our preview. It actually gets even better from this. So we're going to use something called cross-function. We'll talk about it more in detail. And our interface, instead of having a, a class or a struct, we make it a template. And we're defined from a structure called define interface. So we ha and then we have cross function, and we just pass in this, you know, the, our interface um, specialization, and then we number, so position zero, and then basically we pass in a signature. So this is the same signature, so you'd pass into std function, so void string string, uh, and then two bool string, and then. For out parameters, you have to do a little bit differently. So there's a, it provides something called out that you can use uh, with any type, with the types that it supports. And you can use an out parameter. Uh, our delete, our destroy. And then in our, in our um, interface, you basically had initialized each one with this. All right, so here's how our implementation looks like. So, in your constructor, basically assign it a lambda. This, key, value, boom. Get, 
find it. If it's not false, set return true. Um, delete, find, return, if we can't find a return false, otherwise return, you know, erase it and return true. If any of this towards an exception, it'll get trapped and handled uh, back to the client side. It's a lot like what people do in JavaScript. In, do we, in terms of, with the, in, yeah, in terms of uh, defining the, uh, of the classes in JavaScript where you define basically, you know, you've got the Java functions and you just assign to them. But basically, you know, we can get high level, we do high level things. Now, uh, we get something called a get portable base, which, which basically gets us the pointer that's basically, a, you know, like the V table structure. And this is how we use it. Uh, create. And M is, M is like a, a little module thing that basically will load up a, uh, load up like a DLL on Windows or a SO on uh, Linux. And it'll call create implement KV store. It's expecting a portable base. And it'll convert it to use interface of interface KV store. And you just use the dot operator and destroy it at the end. Now, how many like this version better than the old version? So how do we get from the old version to the new version? All right. So there's a couple of, there's six key steps that we do to get there. So we'll start early. Yes? Can I back you up for just a minute? Sure. Why is there an explicit destroy necessary? Why not have an RAI type to manage it? OK, uh, we, we will get to that. Like this, I just wanted to. Oh, sorry. Uh, why, why is, let me just go back. Why is there an explicit destroy and why not an RAII type? I agree it's important, but basically we're just, we're starting out with this basis and then we can build on that and we can add the RAI type on top of this. Okay, so functions. So standard function basically enables you to call any callable entity with the same syntax. It's got built-in polymorphism, and it handles all the hard work from getting you from called implementation. So imagine like writing an interface like this. Say hello, say multiples. Like I said, it would look a lot like JavaScript. But you, know, you could do it. You could have polymorphism, pass them around. So what I did is I went from this, from function, to something, let's call it cross-function. So it takes a signature like standard function. When it used for implementation, it provides a static function for the V table that is low level. It takes error codes, takes returns error code, takes the real return value by pointer and assigns to it. And the V table function then accesses a stored STD function with the same signature as the cross function, and it converts from the low level to the high level. And it catches any exceptions that are thrown, translates them to error codes. When you use this cross function for, when you're, for usage, it provides an operator function call that takes the high level parameters, converts them to low level, calls the vtable function, uh, gets the return error code from the vtable function, and turns that into an exception if necessary, and returns a real error, and returns like basically a logical error code. So what do we mean by high-level types and low-level types? Low-level, we mean types that are trivially copyable and standard layout. High-level, everything else. So trivially copyable classes, non this is from this um, C++ 11 standard, non no non-trivial copy constructor, can have a copy constructor, move constructor, copy assignment operator, move assignment operator, and you have a trivial destructor. So this is what determines it being trivial copy move constructor, has been neither user provided nor deleted, no virtual functions, no virtual base classes, and all the subject sub objects had to be trivial as well. Simon operator, trivial destructor, can't be virtual, and all direct pass cla base classes had to have trivial destructors. Standard layout class. Now this is an update from the old POD. 
that was in C++ 98. No non-static <laughs> data members of type, non-standard layout classes, no virtual functions, no base classes, uh, no base class of the same type as, so several rules. And it's got to know that they're useful for communicating with code written in other programming languages. Their layout is specified in 9.2. So basically, if you can create standard layout classes, you know, provide you know, maybe the right pragmas for packing to the compiler, we can expect to go from compiler A to compiler B you know, with our results intact. All right, so uh, remember our programmer generated V table. So we're going to work on a simple cross function. All right, so we're going to work on a simple cross function that's hardwired for put. All right, so crimple cross function one, and we spread it off into usage and implementation. So we store our IKV store there too. So we basically store pointed to our to our hand generated V table, and this is our operator um, paren paren. So key value. So we call put key dot data key dot size value dot data value dot size. If error, throw runtime error, error input. And then we initialize it. And then we create our usage wrapper that basically declares this put and initializes it. Any fun? And then here's our implementation. We create our put. This is static, very C-like. So basically, we take everything as pointers. And like I said, everything is trivially copyable. So we create our key. And then we, we, in here, we store a pointer to a fun std function that put there. So then we just cast it back, call it, and then return 0 for succeed. If there's an exception, return 1, negative 1. Operator equal just. We can assign any type of functor to it. We just assign that to the standard function. And then we assign our, our, our function put to the pointer there so we know we can get it. And our vtable, we assign the function pointer. So then once we've got that, uh, we can define the implementation for it. We can use an implementation thing. And if we implement the interface, we just say, OK, this is our implementation. And we assign our value for that. We assign our function, our lambda. Getting the interface, let's create it new. And um, you know, we, 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 wanna, we can't return the actual object, so we return the, um, basically the pointer to the V table there. Our usage gets a lot easier. So it makes implementation usage easier, but it's, it's hardwired for put, right? You don't want to write a function like that for every single, every single interface member. So instead of that, so we can generalize. So we're using an array of function pointers instead of named function pointers. We hold an array of void pointers so the function object can store the information for the vtable function. We make the function template take an additional uh, integer parameter so it can use that to find the appropriate vtable function. All right, so array of function pointers, having name function pointers is not flexible. So we use an array, uh, array of function pointers. So what type do we use for the array? It doesn't matter. As long as it's a function pointer type and we never call it with an incorrect type, we're fine. So here's the code from the actual library there. So we type def a pointer fun void t. And then we have this structure called uh, portable base, which has a pointer to an array of uh, pointer fun void t. And we just call that VF pointer. And then we create a V table. This is also from the this is also from the library code itself. So we inherit from portable base and we store a, a pointer to pointers of P data. Uh, ignore this part for now. All right. Then our V table, we make it, uh, we take it an int so that specifies what size we want it. We inherit from V table base n, and we just uh, an array of data that takes void, that's void star, and then this is the actual 
allocation of where our pointer function table is. And then basically we passed this up. We said the VF pointer to that and then said the data to that. Said the data pointer above us to that. Any questions? All right, so we're going to create the usage part. So we take an int n, and here we take the portable base, and uh, we get the, the pointer at portable base n, and then we cast it to our fun pointer t that we typed deft here, and then we call it. And same as before, if, it's, if, it's the val if it returns an error value, we throw a runtime error. Our implementation, type def, same thing, same thing that we use here. We store the function there. Um, same, similar implementation as before. We, we get our data, we get the function pointer from our pdata n, and then call it. Store the functor that you, know, you can use with operator equal. And um, s you know, store in the, in the function pointer, function pointer we store our function, and in the data we store our uh, STD function. And then we can define this. So cross function simple to usage, we put zero put. And then we get a, you know, you pass the portable base and we pass the P there. And our implementation, we use the same thing. And basically if we wanted to use the same signature again, we could, you know, use number one and do it somewhere else. Okay, so more general, uh, we don't rely on the name but on a position. However, we're defining the interface twice, once for use and once for implementation. So we're defining a usage wrapper and an imp for one for implementation and one for usage. All right. Next part, make the, use a template class to specify the implementation and make the function template take another parameter and partially specialize on that to determine if it's for usage or for implementation. So here's how we can get away from defining our you know, two interfaces. So here we take a, uh, a template parameter that's a template class to an interface. And for usage, we'll, we'll specialize it on use interface. And then we will use, well, sorry, we have a use interface and then we have an implement interface. And our implement interface we inherit from vtable. For now, we're just going to use vtable for it. We'll hard code it. So this is simple cross function three. So we take class t as the first parameter. And so we define it for usage first, same as before. And then for implementation, um, partial specialization, we define the function same as before, same as before. And then when we define the interface, we define interface class T, pass that in again, and zero for our put, pass in the portable base. When we implement, implementation, we put implement interface, and then we do our implementation there. And when we use it, we use use interface, put our key value. Any questions? So right now we're, we're hard coded for this particular function, function signature. Uh, but now we've generalized away from the name, we've generalized away from the position, and um, we've generalized it to one thing can represent both the implementation and the usage. So next, we need to automate our conversion from the high-level function to the low-level functions. For that, we use something called cross-conversion. Uh, it converts to and from a trivial type. Uh, it may be specialized. If the type is already layout, standard layout, trivial compatible, there's a track class trivial com conversion that's provided that you can just inherit from. Uh, trivial conversions are provided for char, uh, int 8, 16, 32, 64, float, double, and void. There's specializations that are provided for bool, string, 
vector and pair. There's no specialization provided for long double. <coughs> so here's what trivial looks like. Trivial so we different two type defs, converted type, original type, and then there's two converted type, two original type. So this one, nothing to do. So to use this for like say void, specialized for void, derived from the trivial conversion. For string, we need to come up with a way to define a trivial type for string. So good way is uh, constant car begin, constant car end. Specialized for string. So original type is standard string. Our converted type is going to be cross string that we saw before. And then to converted type, we set the begin, set the end, and return it. And then we take the converted type, which has the begin and end, and convert it back to a string on the other side. So now we can generalize this. And this is our simple cross function for. Uh, takes a signature. And we'll just provide a specialization for void parm1, parm2. Now part of this you have to do is the, I ran into a bunch of compiler bugs when doing this. So this seems to keep them quiet. Uh, but anyway. So, yes? When you convert from cross string back to string, if this is a return value, I can return a string, right? Yes, you can. Where's, where's the memory coming from? OK. So return value, so, OK. So when we're converting from uh, cross string to a string, and we can return the values, where is it coming from? to like a temporary object that's going to go out of scope and we're going to be left host, correct? Yeah. All right. So originally, I had this basically allocate, allocate a you know, buffer, copy it into it, and copy it out of. Um, I got some slides at the end. But basically, we handle return types a little bit differently. And the reason for this is for the parameters, we know the original is sticking around. For the return type, it's there. Uh, I will show you. Remind me at the end, because I, I had it at the end of the slides there. All right. So here we do to convert a type P1, P2. You know, same as before, but instead we're using to convert a type. Wait, let's see here. Has problems there. And then the, here we go to original type, to original type. Any questions there? So now B, we've generalized to something that you know, can take anything that can take two parameters and return a void, you know, we're good. So the next part, basically, we use variadic templates. And I won't put that in there. So let's see how you do various things with the library. So here's how you define an interface. You inherit from define interface T. You take class T, you inherit from define interface. Um, you number. So 0, 1, 2, 3. Our signature, signature, signature. And then you pass in this. OK, if you don't, uh, this doesn't work with MSVC, but with uh, GCC and Clang, you can use using and um, uh, this way to make it easier for yourself. So we're just repeating this all the time. The interface KV source with the ID and F. So we can go CV, CF0 equals this, equals this, equals this, equals this. Any questions? Yes. Yes. Uh, you say does not work with MSVC currently? Yeah. Version of MSVC. I'm using the, the only wor version this compiles on is the November 11th CTP which was MSVC 2000, was it uh, version 11, the November uh, consumer technology preview that added support for variadic templates. Hopefully, they will release one that will soon. Someday. All right. Now, what happens if we do this? So notice, define interface does not take a parameter that specifies how big the V table is. So how do we calculate how big it is? And what happens if you misnumber? 
Well, if you miss number and you didn't catch it, you're going to have some horrible bugs as basically you try calling a function pointer on something that is the wrong type and it's expecting the wrong type. So what happens if you put this in compile? You actually get an error message. The IDs for this need to be in ascending order from zero. You have possibly repeated a number. See reference to class instantiation. How do we do that? So we have two structs. One is size only and checksum only. And remember, we can, we, all of our cross functions take a template, right? Uh, that we sp so we can partially specify it for size only. And here we just put a char array with 1024. And when it's passing the checksum, we can do 1020, basically ID squared times 1024. ID plus one squared times 1024. All right. Then we calculate, this, use size of to calculate size of I size only and cross function I size only. And with 1024, it's basically, even if you have a little bit of alignment issues or you have like, an, you know, something has a member variable, that's going to overwhelm it and we'll get the number of functions. Then we double check them by noting that the sum of squares is, you know, n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 all over 6. So if the sizes up don't match that, then we know we've got a misnumbering error in there somewhere. So what types do we support? So the types listed in blue are trivial, char, int 8, 16, 32, 64, float double, const and const of the above, constant void star, bool, string, vector pair, uh, CR string, which is basically an adaptation of ref string from boost 1.53, uh, the reason I adapted it is, the, as listed there, it's not trivially copyable as implementation in Boost right now. And we can pass use interface and use unknown. You, we'll get to this later. And then we can pass an out T. Uh, we can do interface inheritance. So we can inherit from an interface and we just specify a base interface. On the defined interface, it takes the default parameter that you can specify. You don't have to change anything else in the interface. You don't have to renumber your functions. <coughs> How you use it, uh, this is the thing that basically loads a module and you ask it to create an interface, you know, create interface from this function. Implementation by JavaScript. Now, if you want to use a member function instead of a lambda, you can do that. There's a thing called set member function. And it takes these as template parameters. And basically what it does is, because the compiler can see this, it should be able to avoid the se uh, second indirect function call. Because SCD function it, with the type of ratio, you're going to take another indirect function call. So this limits it from 2 to 1. So we can reuse. So reuse interfaces, we can inherit an interface as we did above. Uh, we can reuse the implementation of an interface via source reuse. So if you have an interface that's used a lot, you define a class to implement that, and then use containment. Or else you can also reuse implementation of an interface via binary reuse. So source reuse. So, so we've got a property interface. So we've got a property, set property, get property. Now you may have a bunch of you know, classes or things that are going to use this. But like I said, the implementation, you just want to do it one time and just get it done. So we can create a reusable implementation that, say, uses an SCD map, implementation helper, and you pass in implement interface as a reference, and, you know, it'll set the, uh, it'll set the functions to the proper, to what it should be, to the implementation. And then you just our helper. Then our constructor, you just pass that implementation into the helper and implement that. Binary use. Suppose you want to implement an interface in terms of another implementation of that interface. Okay. The implementation could be another DLL or possibly one that was compiled with another compiler. How do you do that? Well, a couple ways. One thing, you can implement all the interface methods and manually forward them on, right? But that's going to get, that gets tedious. Anybody use com aggregation? Um, complicated, and the component already has supported. Whereas here, we got something called set runtime parent. So basically, if an interface method 
does not have a lambda assigned to it, any call on that interface will be forwarded to the runtime parent. So basically, so we say we have an awesome DLL here that implements our property interface. It's binary though. So we use it to create the property manager. Um, let's see here, or implementate or other. And then we call set runtime parent other. And uh, we can still, if we assign something to it, it'll take, our, it'll take our implementation. If there's nothing assigned to it, it'll just forward that on to runtime parent. How does it work? So our V table base N, where we had a pointer to the void data, we've also got a pointer to runtime parent. And if it's, so then inside the, B, inside the V table function, that we assign there, it's got this thing that says get function. If it's not f, we get the runtime parent and we pass along the parameters to them and return that. All right, so as you mentioned before, lifetime management and multiple interfaces. So far, we've considered single interfaces with a destroy function. So, what if we want multiple interfaces on automatic lifetime management? We need a way to get from one interface to another. We can't use dynamic cast because RTTI is implementation dependent. Uh, we could do reference management, reference counting. So we need an interface that can handle lifetime management and interface discovery. Any suggestions? Our friend. So a query interface, add ref release. All right. But you never had to implement those. Defining interfaces and it and it's made, it'll work on Linux too. Like the same code will work on compile with Linux, no changes. It works. So we use define unknown interface. Takes the same parameters of define interface, except it takes a UUID as well. And if you want to generate UUIDs, there's a program in the in the Git repository that uses boost UUID to generate that. So this is our final interface, a UUID cross compiler. We define you know, CR string, so it's constant ref. So we're not like copying copies. Implementation it has a two string converted there. And this is how we use it. Create unknown, create interface, and we just pass it the interface that we want as a template parameter, and it automatically gives us the correct type. And we never, and it calls release when we're done. So how does error handling work? Well, all, we use basically to build on H result, all the V table functions return a 32-bit sign integer, zero success, negative value is an error. Has functions return exceptions to error codes and error codes exceptions. Support 15 error codes so far with other class, with the classes specifically. Other error codes that could, could turn into a generic exception. So what's called interface error base that has get error code. So basically also map like, you know, say if you use at and you get, I think the uh, incorrect index exception there, maps it back to the correct H results so it'll get translated something so you can catch it as that on the other side. All right, what if the cross function doesn't do what you want it to do? So we can define a, a custom cross function. So it takes an interface, you know, which we do from before, an ID as before, but it takes uh, two signatures. One signature is going to be your high level signature. The other signature is going to be a low level signature. And to use it, you basically, you derive from that and pass the derived type. So when implementing imp I unknown support, we ha like add ref, this is add ref and release have this signature. This is not what our, you know, our code will generate by itself. So what do we do? We do derive from custom cross function, specify our signature, and then we write a function called, called vtable function, and then vtable function. So this will be our vtable function, and this will be used by the operator uh, print print. How do we use it? Query interface, add ref, release. 
How much are we paying for this convenience? Um, try to make it acceptable by providing set memory function. Don't allocate any memory on our own. And use function pointers to assign return values to strings. I'll get into that uh, per your question. So simple benchmark. I think I did like a million function calls. And this, the long string test and return test that I mark long are 4K in size. So right here is basically just using a virtual, just as you, virtual interface as you would use with standard string. This is intracompiler, so it, no incompatibilities. This is using standard function, and this is using mem function. So shorter is better. So basically, mem function performs pretty much the close to virtual, except for the long string return, uh, where virtual outperforms it. I think the reason for this is, I think the compiler, because it sees it, is able to do, I guess, I think a, a return value optimization, whereas in our case, since we're doing it by hand, we miss out on that. All right, so this is what we have here. How many of you think it looks easier than before? All right, I guess it's easy compared to, you know, compared to using the C stuff. But it's, it's kind of like uh, you know, Jesse, J Jesse James' funeral. Apparently, there's a story that uh, Frank James said, if anybody would say at, Jesse, at his brother's funeral that he was a saint, he would give him $10,000. So finally, one preacher agreed, and everybody showed up at the funeral. And the preacher gets up and goes, well, you know, we all know this guy was a murderer, was a bank robber, was a thief. But compared to his brother, he was a saint. <laughs> So, you know, this is not necessarily easy, but can we make it any easier? <laughs> the answer is no. Unless <laughs> we use macros. So, with using macros, we can do like this. Yes. Yes. Uh, this is, well, uh, here's this macro. This is how you define it. You, there's no signature there. You just define it as a normal function, normal function, normal function. Then you just call this macro. What's the definition of macro? I'll show it. <laughs> but like I said, this is about as I mean, this is about as functionally. I mean, you need all these things for it to functionally be there. And like I said, if if you used Instead of unknown, you just run a regular interface, you could leave out this uh, UUID and just have basically a definition, just like you define any struct with this macro. And implementation, how do you implement? Remember your set of implementation looked like JavaScript? Okay, here, we've got member functions. <coughs> member functions, how do we map them all? Map to member function, no prefix. Sometimes macros can be good. So this is how we create it. This is how we use it. So how does this macro work? Here, this is something ugly. Uh, so basically, some preprocessor magic. So let me just, all right, so semicolon apply basically takes a bunch of statements, puts semicolons at the end of each. Apply puts commas in between. So basically, we take we create a template class as a subclass of that called de template. De uh, where are we here? All right. So just memory that. Out. Okay. Qu define the interface unknown type UUID VA args, and in there, what we do is we basically take each of the values. So this function right here will re take a pointer to a member function and return the corresponding cross-function pointer. Any, does anybody have any questions? So basically, takes this thing, so it turns a pointer to a member function into a cross-function. And then basically, f we, we map, we basically, for inside there, for each value, we create a cross function with the same name and the same signature underneath. Oh, and um, we also get introspection thrown in for free. With the return types, return types raw. 
and then what our function run there is. Any questions? Yes. We can't, I can't do cross, like from Linux to Windows, like, you know, cross OS, can't do that. But if you have like, say the, M, like was it the Ming W distribution of GCC on Windows, you can do that. And it's been tested there. So I, I've ran the test under using uh, GCC 4.7.2 and 0.8 on Windows and using Visual C++. And then on Linux, I use Clang and uh, GCC. Yes. You could, but vi it has a support uh, variadic templates in C++ 11. Yeah, that, that would be the problem. I tried backporting it without variadic templates, and that is an exercise in frustration. So what are the benefits? I think you can have modularity. We can upgrade change compilers without breaking compatibility. We can, if you support plugins, instead of requiring you need this compiler with this standard library version, you can allow it to be written with any compliant compiler. And I think also make it easy to create pre-built components to work with multiple compilers. This is from a Herb slide where he talks about the size of the library. And I think one of the problems is if you build a C++ library, you know, building it in like 15 different versions of compilers and standard libraries and debug and release settings, I mean, you know, that, that, you know, that's quite an undertaking. If you're relying on something there, you know, that has to be rebuilt as well. Whereas, you know, I think if you had something that you know, you knew it would work, doesn't matter what the compiler and runtime was, and you could depend on that. I think we could see more library use and maybe more library building. So I'll take any questions and comments. Do you have any problems if you have, a, you have one module compiled and you're using one standard library coming in as a shared object and another with a different version of the standard library of cross pollinating those? We're, we're converting them to, sorry, or do you have any problems with using one standard library that has one version of, say, standard string or standard vector and using it with another standard library? But, but the shared libraries themselves, with their symbols being the same processors. Right. Um, we get around that by dynamically loading them. Like, you know, that's what the module was doing. If you had them statically linked, I think the linker, you know, might have problems with that one. But basically, we're doing what, what, com, what you've been doing with COM all along. You know, we're just making it easy from C++. So we had a question. Oh, go ahead. The biggest thing has been Visual Studio, it's, and say GCC. At least right now, they have different supports for, you know, for different versions of the standard. So say you want to, you know, there's some stuff that you can do in Visual C++ that you can't do in say, GCC. And there's some stuff that you can do in GCC that you can't do in uh, Ming W. Let me just give you a quick short. So for example, uh, level DB, anybody used it, heard of it? You know, basically, it's like a key value store. It's from, it's from Windows, but it's, it's, it comes from a Linux background. Easy to build on Linux, hard to build on Visual C++, but it's got Mac files. It supports GCC out of the box. Okay, so you can compile it on GCC, put in the stuff, and use it from Visual C++ all through a high-level interface. Uh, the other, other thing is with uh, Visual C++, um, different versions are not binary compatible. So if you've got, 
So if you've got something that needs to, so, so we say you've got a library that's built, say with version X, version X plus one comes out, you're going to have to rebuild everything, recompile everything, relink everything. Whereas if this was the same, um, if, the, if this was using independent thing, you could still continue to use them. The other thing, the other thing is plugins. Like if you want to make your, you know, your application or something, people write plugins. You know, give them choice. They can use whatever compiler they want. You know, you know they may have their preferences and let it work. Go ahead. You want to repeat things, though? Uh, sure. So your question is, if I can summarize, what's the real world usage of this? Like, where do you use multiple different uh, compilers and or runtime libraries? You're going to make them sync anyway. Is that is that a yeah, correct I mean, statement? Typically, you're going to you're going to have your your runtimes all set up, and, and that's the way we do it. We have we have everything organized by SDK. Go ahead. I was going to say, one area where you run into it is when it's very, very costly to go back if you're a highly regulated business, or you have to have all your software go through very extraneous tests, and every time you make a single modification, you pay a huge fee to have it recheck, and you want to keep those um, shared libraries, you know, pseudo plugin if you want, for a long period of time without modification, because there's just a huge cost to do so, there's a huge cost to retest it. And when they're working, but yet you want to move your main base or your mainline code forward under new compilers or turn on C11 and have this stuff continue to exist. Uh, it's, it's useful at a cost basis if you're talking about large projects, and especially large. You're not just rebuilding it, shoving it on the internet, telling them to download it because you don't have a distribution model that matches that. You basically have to go through a huge test procedure, a very controlled distribution uh, and deployment. And really, it's not worth it for you to do. To rebuild all that stuff because someone decided to want to change a parameter interface somewhere or add a new function or do something along that line. But is that really what's being talked about? Well, that's what I came here to, to watch to see how that would how this kind of thing would solve those kind of problems. We we have a model that's very similar to this, it's just older implementation. And then I wanted to ask about uh, answer about return values. So for return values we have the problem with allocation. So, so we have a specific uh, template, cross-conversion return. Uh, we store re uh, type def return type converted type. And this is the default. So it's, it's got initialize return, do return, finalize return. Initialize return and finalize return happen on the caller side of the ABI boundary. Do return happens on the implementation side of the ABI boundary. So the default is just... Uh, can you know move it from a uh, return type to a converted type, and then finalize return goes from original type to the converted type. And the code that uses it, so this is the call adapter, but basically, vtable caller. This is used by uh, operator print print, and 
you've got v initialize return here. Then after you've done the call, you call finalize return. And in the vtable function, uh, you've got do return that takes the return value that's returned by f. Right, so, so it's string. So we can't just, you know, just copy stuff blindly. So what we do is we write a, it has a, it has a static function called do transfer string. And it's, and basically that'll take a string and take a begin and end and assign it to that. And return a, a error code if it has a problem. So basically, so in an initialized return, um, register equals r. So basically, this is a void pointer. And then we set up the function pointer. So our do return, we call our function pointer on our original void pointer that we stored on the user side of the ABI. And, and this will, it's a single indirect call, will transport, will transfer you know, a string of any size without, you know, without making an extra copy of it. That's how that works. Any other questions, comments? And anybody may using anything similar to this or have, you know, similar, I guess, similar problems that they've run up against with? Mm -hmm. Let's imagine I'm writing an OS as I'm writing an OS. Um, and basically, I'm writing APIs for phone. Right? Mm -hmm. You, you uh, write an app for my phone, and you call all my API functions, and then I update my API. I update my libraries because you know, version 10.2 of the phone. Mm -hmm. Right. Minutes. So you said that uh, earlier that, that Kong had a memory allocation issue solved by a specialized memory allocator. Right. So how do you solve that, or you just simply? We don't. We, the library never allocates memory. It basically stores a function pointer to something that knows how to do the transfer. Can you repeat the question? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm getting it. So the question is, how do we solve the problem of cross memory allocation? Right. That's a pretty good example. Uh, you know, cross boundary allocation across the ABI. And the problem is we don't allocate, the library ne doesn't allocate memory across, that, that's freed across the ABI boundary. For its strings or whatever, we rely on basically another function pointer that knows how to construct the string on the correct side to be able to do that. So you, you, you simply don't recommend that the ABI pass like a, a, a char pointer or something like that across no, I, STD string, and then the STD string, or you know, CR, you know, some type of constant ref, you know, ref string, or something that's encapsulate, you know, that encapsulates the memory. Right. The, the, 
they are compatible enough, like name magnet doesn't change, you know, and stuff like that, that, that a subset of the problem is actually much easier to solve, you know, where you just have to kind of stick to certain types and then you, know, hmm. you will be at least compatible from version to version. <coughs> so the, the question is, a subset of this problem might be, you know, easier to solve, you know, with like name mangling yeah. and, and issues like that. The pro you can exclude those problems. Right. The, the big issue is the standard library. Because right. the standard library implementation changes, it can change. And you know, if, you're, if you want to, you know, and without the standard library, you're basically stuck programming you know, at either you know, char star level or else writing your own custom wrapper that you know, you know goes both ways. Right. So essentially, just using your cross conversion right. functionality you know, manually. Correct. Right, right. You you could use that. You know, you could use the uh, cross conversions and, and go back and forth. That's really ninety percent of the problem in most cases. Correct. Thank you. I'd, I'd be you know happy to answer any questions or talk with you guys afterward. Um, if anybody's interested, I've got. Some other examples or you know, just how, how stuff worked. Um, there's a library for you know, writing components in WinRT that's based on this that you know, provides real constructors and uh, implementation stuff, you know, kind of like C++ CX, but with C++ 11. So I'll be inter if anybody's interested in that, I can you know, show you that. Thank you very much for your attention.